Welcome to The Business Grind, where we give you an inside perspective on what it takes to start, build, and run a successful business. Here are your hosts, Danny Shaw and Sean Michael Wellington. All right. Hello to everyone in podcast land today. Uh, thanks for joining us, Sean. How are we feeling? I'm feeling marvelous today. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to start laughing so hard. Go ahead, continue. How you feeling today? No, that's it. I mean, okay. I, didn't, I didn't know I was going to say that. that oh, you didn't? Because that felt very no, clear. I didn't play that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds but, good. But no, nah, we're here because we got another book review and it's about Marvel and the MCU specifically. So that's exciting. Absolutely, yeah. So as Sean was saying, today we're going to discuss uh, the book, uh, book review of MCU, The Reign of Marvel Studios by Joanna Robinson, Dave Gonzalez, and Gavin Edwards, right? All right, so let's dive in. You already ready, I see, Sean. So how we, how you want to approach? You want to just start talking? Did you like it? Did you not? Um, I think we should give a little context, though, um, as far as what this book is and isn't about, because I, I know a lot of people, when they hear the word Marvel, uh, they kind of think it's it's everything right um so yeah. this book is specifically about marvel studios uh and marvel studios is the arm of marvel that creates the uh, marvel cinematic universe movies such as the avengers iron man uh black panther uh i mean i'm, I'm drawing a blank but all those movies for the most part right uh but not to be confused because there are other marvel movies that do uh, get produced and uh, released to the public uh, under other companies such as from Sony, such as the Spider-Man movies, like with Andrew Garfield and and Tobey Maguire, um, and not to be confused with uh, Marvel as a whole, which plays a role in Marvel Studios. But you know, and we, we'll get into. But this is specific to Marvel Studios, the production company that creates the movies as part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? Right, and I also believe that the cartoons, or some of them, like you said, certain right. cartoons are also under that studio umbrella as well. Absolutely. So, and you know, as we get into the book, it'll start breaking down the differences of, of that as well, and and you know where the lines are drawn and where it gets a little blurry and, and stuff like that. Right. Uh, so I think that's just something we should just kind of speak on before we jump into the nuances and, and stuff of the book and details. This book is very exhaustive. It's, it's pretty much the history of all Marvel movies, cinematic movies from beginning to end uh, up until maybe, I'm thinking out of all the movie, Marvel movies that have been released, you know, the ones that they haven't covered, it's probably been the Marvels and Guardian of the Galaxy 3, which both are recent releases as of this or last year. Uh, but outside of that, it goes into everything, the beginning and the end, Marvel's the, the, the history of Marvel Comics, uh, their toy business, how they got into the film industry, um, and so forth. So it is quite the read, to to say the least, right? Um, so as a comic book fan, you know, I think anyone who is a fan of Marvel and, and Marvel as a whole or the movie Cinematic Universe, they will definitely uh, enjoy the nuances and behind-the-scenes stories, the good, the bad, and and, and the ugly <laughs> with 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 what went on be, behind the scenes to get it to where it's at today. Um, so I think it's it's good on that part. And then also on the business side, because it does speak to a lot of the business uh, dynamics uh, and deals that was made that led to their success. Some good, some bad, some was just straight out atrocious <laughs> on the way in hindsight, in hindsight, right? Uh, so yeah, so where would you like to start off with, uh, Sean? Um, well, I mean, I guess one question I have for you was, because for me, I, what I wasn't aware of when I talk about like some of the new things I learned, I wasn't aware of how many, um, how, how poorly the company was doing and how close they were to like going under basically. Absolutely. I didn't know how dire the straits were. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I was, I was definitely aware of, of Marvel doing bad. And I think the comic industry as a whole was doing bad and, and I don't, I don't. I used to collect comic books, right? And I definitely remember that craze of of 
these variant comic covers and holographic and it's going to be a collector's item and you would buy these comics and you couldn't even touch it anymore. You know, as soon as you brought it, you put it in the case in those protective seals. I remember buying those uh, comic book indexes uh, that would show how much your comic book should be worth if you mint condition, good condition, fair condition. It was, it was, wow, I forgot about those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it created... It sounds very similar to the what the world we're in today. They create a comic book bubble, right? All these different car uh, comics and and just the variations and just trying to make all this money and the trading cards as well. Uh, I definitely was all in, but during that time they were definitely in a lot of uh, financial straits because of this bubble. Uh, uh, and on top of that. So we have the comics that wasn't doing well, then the finances wasn't doing well, and then there was a lot of these licensing deals with toy companies that good, bad, it, it just was, it was changing hands and ownership and, you know, the fees uh, of the percentage cuts, it, it was kind of, kind of a mess. So Marvel was in, in, in some tight scenarios based off these, based off the bubbles of, bubble of the comic industry and as, and because of the bad deals that they were locked into early on to try to help get them out of it yeah yeah, yeah it was it was interesting and um another thing that i didn't know is kind of how low on the totem pole kevin feige started at you know oh, i yeah, never yeah. realized that where he came from so that was interesting to me too right right so and I, I guess let's let's set up who kevin feige i mean everyone should know who he is <laughs> he's everybody i who, don't know who don't know I, kevin I, feige. all right well tell us right. for those who don't know who is kevin feige well, Kevin Feige is the current president of Marvel, and he's kind of the person who engineered their multi-movie franchise, like tying the, making sure the storylines bled into each other and built to the first Avengers movie. He's kind of the, the right. brainchild behind that. Right, right. And and so you were you weren't aware of his early career uh, roles and responsibilities from way back when. Right. Yeah, I was not aware of that. And and for those who may not be aware, even. And, oh, this is good because we'll talk about these different deals. Even though um, at the time there was not a quote-unquote Marvel Cinematic Universe, he had a role early on in those early X-Men movies uh, and, and that was put out by Fox, which, again, this goes into the differences of the type of deals that Marvel had signed at the time. So Fox was able to produce Marvel movies under their own umbrella uh, um, without much... They had the rights to make these movies. Um, there was no Marvel Studios at the time, but Kevin Feige was one who was actually uh, on set and helping to, you know, lend his voice to the creative direction of the flow of those early movies with Hugh Jackman and Holly Berry and Patrick Stewart, right? Right, and it's interesting because Fox Studios, you know, they were kind of the first... Um, their first lifeline as a company. It was Marvel's first lifeline, really, mm -hmm. when you think about it, because they purchased their biggest two uh, franchises, their biggest two, biggest two comic book franchises in the Fantastic Four, mm -hmm. and that's, they mm -hmm. got priced those right away. So. Right, right. So let's go back into that deal that Marvel signed early on before there was a, a, a Marvel studio, right? So prior to that, they had signed, it was a deal with Fox, right? Like you just said, for X-Men, and Fantastic Four, and then they also uh, signed the deal with Sony for the rights to Spider-Man, right? Um, right, and then, correct me if I'm wrong, was Universal and the Hulk, they had some sort of there, deal too? Mm -hmm, there was a partnership with Universal and the Hulk as well. So what you would, what you noticed early on is that Marvel had, Marvel as a whole didn't really have a vision for a movie studio or a movie production, anything like that. Their main goal at the time was trying to get out of bankruptcy and, and you know, become, pro you know, just be more profitable and ultimately sell more toys, <laughs> right? Um, that, that was their vision. And that was because of, you know, the vision of the CEO at the time, Ike. I'm forgetting his last name at the moment, but um, Ike was the head of Marvel as a whole and his, you know, he was just focused on comic book and toy sales. That was his lifeline of, of how he made business, right? Um, Mike Perlmutter, actually, yes. Yeah. So he was known for being notoriously frugal. Uh, and as we know, creating movies and producing movies are not the most uh, cost-effective thing to do, especially when you're talking about blockbusters and you're talking about superheroes and special effects. 
those type of things can get costly. He wasn't really interested in that. Uh, so because of that, it was more about, hey, can we license these characters and sell the rights uh, to the movie theaters? Uh, they will make the movies for us and we will uh, create the toys. And because these studios are making the movies, it will lead to more toy sales, which will benefit Marvel in, in, the, in the end. All right. They were getting, uh, I think, I, if I'm not mistaken, on the on Spider Man, they only got like five percent of the royalties from the Spider Man movies and, and stuff like that, you know. Uh, and they wasn't really concerned with the movie side of the business. Uh, it was really, really all about the toys at the time. So that's why. And that was partially ahead. because of. Oh, I'm sorry. That was partially because of because they were doing so poorly and just right. the toy business, like the toy company was the parent company almost. Right. right. So, pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. Pretty much. So, um, and it was not much of a focus. So one thing I did like is that, um, they acknowledge when it started looking like comic book movies as a whole and Marvel movies as a whole could start be take, could start to be taken a bit more seriously. Uh, and I believe that was uh, with Blade, right? Uh, the book did acknowledge Blade, which I always appreciate because Blade Erasure is very real <laughs> in the comic book. <laughs> and when a lot of people talk about uh, comic movies as a whole and what led to it to start to be taken seriously. So they did talk about how uh, no one even cared about the Blade character. And, you know, Wesley Snipes and his team uh, got the rights to that movie and did what they did with it. And once that happened, granted, it wasn't like uh, super, it was a blockbuster by no stretch of the imagination, but it wasn't what the movies, superhero movies of today do. But it was definitely enough to be like, oh, there is something actually here if we can do it right, right? Uh, right. Up, in, up until that point, you saw all these, you know, they go into the history of, uh, you know, some success with like the old Incredible Hulk TV show with Lou Ferrigno and things like that. But they also talk about the the ultra failures like that old Fantastic Four movie that is like of infamy, infamous lore nowadays. If any of y'all ever get a chance to see that old, there's an old Fantastic Four movie. It's probably floating around on YouTube. It was just bad, right? So they yeah. they <laughs> they go into all the, the misses and failures leading up, up until, you know, the present day. So there was a lot of false starts and a lot of misses. But, you know, right around the time Blade and other movies started coming around, the, the I guess you could say the coin they kind of turned the corner on seeing what could happen. Um, it doesn't mean that it was still successful out the gate. They still had some misses, like those Fantastic Four movies. You know, I really did not care. If, I saw both of those movies in the theaters, and I just couldn't understand how they got it wrong. Uh, but now that I knew the backstory and, and the legalities around what characters they could use and what they couldn't use and what they can and can't say, uh, it kind of made a bit more sense to me now. Right. And just going back to Blade a little bit, I mean, that movie at the time, which, you know, compared to Marvel movies now, mm -hmm. is probably a flop. But at the time, it made $70 million domestically, which is great back then. Right. But I, it, w it was crazy to read, for me to read that Marvel only made twenty five k off of that <laughs> $70 million. Like, and that was just the licensing deal that they had. Right. right. New Line was producing the movie and they got the bulk of the profits. So. Mar Marvel was signing 360 deals again. <laughs> getting... Right. <laughs> Marvel was signing them crazy deals and, and getting a small cut of all the intellectual properties that I, you know, they just, I mean, to me, they just didn't know what they had. And sometimes that is a real thing. You don't know what you have, especially when you're facing other mountain business problems, like being totally out of business and going bankrupt. You kind of got to sell what you can sell to keep the lights on. Right. Right. And you mentioned the blade erasure. Now reading this book gives me a whole new perspective on that. So I'm curious your opinion. Do you think it's because they made so much, so little money off of it that they don't talk about it? They don't big it up as kind of like the catalyst that started this this comic book movie juggernaut, you know? Because it really was there at the forefront. It was one of their first big successes, but they don't talk about it. And when I look at this book and I read how like you know that movie didn't have any toys that they could sell off of it and stuff like right. that, and they only made twenty five k. I mean, maybe they don't care to talk about it for that reason. I don't know what do you think. Uh, a little bit of both. I think it's a little bit of both. So we are gonna get into it. So I would probably be mad. I would be a bit mad too um, if 
I sold the rights to a movie and it made seventy million. Um, and I only got twenty five k. I'll be tight, you know. Uh, and that's fair. I also feel like that was on them because they didn't even. It's one thing to feel like you didn't get a good deal, right? I, I'll give you that. But at the same time, it, it's very clear they didn't even have faith in their own IP because they didn't even try to make a toy up through, up from it, right? And when you start hearing about some of the leadership and some of their statements about black characters, um, it's kind of apparent as well as why they wouldn't want to invest any time and effort into this character. Uh, so then now, once you do start becoming successful, I guess you don't want to really acknowledge your biggest, one of your biggest misses and missed opportunities. Uh, and then I think the way the Blade franchise at the time kind of ended, especially with the third version, it didn't end on a uh, a good note. I could see why they're like, eh, we, we Blade Erasure is, is probably best. But you do see that they're trying to now incorporate Blade into the new MCU with the announcements. I know there's been a few false starts with the production and getting the script right for the for the new version, but they are trying to include him into the the new MCU. So yeah, we have heard his voice in the new uh, in the current MCU, but we, yeah, we haven't gotten any movies yet. Or yeah, anything. we only. But, yeah, I was just curious how you felt about <laughs> we that. Heard, yeah, we heard Blaze's voice, uh, and then we heard production. We saw the announcement at Comic Con. Uh, but then now we've, I've, I don't know if you've been keeping track, but I've been keeping track. There's been a, a lot of behind the scene dramas of getting the script right and, and trying to get the production right. And so it's been a, a bit of a false start, but at least this time around, there is an effort to incorporate Blade into the, to the universe. So yeah. Did you ever watch those early Fantastic Four movies that had, um, uh, not the OG one, the, like the one from, what was it, early eighties or no, 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 the ones but in the, the 2000s, 2000s yeah, ones, yeah, the, yeah, the ones with Jessica Alba and, uh, Whoever else, Chris Michael Evans, Chris Evans, Chris Evans, Chris Evans, yeah. Chris Evans, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, I did see those. I didn't hate them. Um, I didn't hate them, but uh-huh. they they didn't set the world on fire. Oh, fair enough. Now I'm. I will say this. I didn't hate them, but the one that they tried to do, it was one of the one with Silver Surfer. I think that was the second one. Yeah, it was. I, I really got mad at that one personally. Uh, because of how they did Galactus? Oh, or because... God. They, oh, my God. Yes, that's why. The way they did Galactus, I I, I just I couldn't understand. I I just couldn't understand the why behind it. Uh, but I did, once I read the book, I said, oh, okay, I guess. But in my opinion, I'm like, why even do that? If you don't have the rights to the character, then why do that to us like that? But... I've moved on. I've moved on. But yes. Um, Here's my thing. That I don't know if you saw the Michael B. Jordan one. I did not. Fantastic I did not. That one is worse than both combined. That's... So <laughs> it, it makes me feel better about the just all the uh, Chris Evans ones because that other, the, the newer one uh-huh. is really, 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 really bad. You, you just... know what's funny? I I probably avoided that one because I knew it was going to be that bad so i will uh i'll take your word for it and i appreciate you saving me a few minutes of watching that movie to come to that same conclusion because uh, <laughs> yeah no it's just yeah, yeah. So- okay so we could we could take that note so note it um so yeah so then you had that um and then we you know the book like i said this book is pretty thick and exhaustive so there's a lot of details in, in in this book about a lot of things in regards to the deal. So, you know, you had the X-Men deal from Fox, then you had the Sony deal from Spider-Man, which was another missed opportunity on their behalf. You know, again, they didn't, they didn't only get uh, 25K this time around, but they definitely, uh, I think it was like 5% on profits or something like that. Still, it was a small amount compared to how much those Tobey Maguire movies and the Garfield movie, Andrew Garfield Spider-Man movies were, were using. Uh, and because of that, you know, to the listeners out there, that's why you've noticed, you know, from there, that's when Marvel and Sony was like, hey, we gotta, let's try to play together to get Spider-Man on this side of the movies of the Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe and Marvel Studios side of the game. Because at that point, from the time that original Spider-Man movie uh, was released with Tobey Maguire, you know, um, th- from that point to where we're at now, 
that's when Marvel Cinematic, Marvel Studios started really picking up their own steam and started doing their own thing and making their own movies. And, you know, it just became hit after hit with Marvel Studios, right? They had the Iron Man, they had um, uh, Avengers, they had all these movies that was really blockbuster movies. And it's like, you know, it's let's try to figure out how we can coexist together. Uh, but before we jump into the, just jump ahead to how Marvel Studios uh, started, I think, um, you know, we should probably talk about the deal that they got and the financing that they got to start their first movies, which was uh, Iron Man, right? And right, it was through Merrill Lynch, if I remember correctly. Yeah, correct. right. Yeah. So it was Iron Man uh, and the Hulk with Edward Norton, and I... I'm not sure what was the third movie that they... It was either Captain America or Thor. It was... Right. It was one of those two. But essentially, the deal they got from Merrill Lynch was they got a loan from Merrill Lynch to cover the cost of making three Marvel films that was under the Marvel Studios banner. Uh, And essentially, the way the deal was structured was that, you know, it was... The way they framed it was like three strikes and you're out. So Marvel, you know, the heads, they felt like, hey, we have three chances to get this right. And if we do, then we are, we can kind of hit, proceed from there. And there wasn't really much expectation at that time. So again, you had the Iron, you had the Blade movies, which were good. You had the X-Men movies, which were, you know, commercially successful, but they still wasn't on the blockbuster level yet, right? Um, And then, so you had... And then Fantastic Four, again, it was like, ugh, I guess, right? It, it's there, but so what? So it wasn't really much high expectation. But then uh, we had the Hulk movie. Now, I'm going to say this. Hulk erasure is also very real. Hulk erasure with Edward Norton is very real as well. You know? Yeah, well, they recasted him, and they kind of want to keep... Yeah, they don't mention that, yeah. I, I like... I liked that movie with Edward Norton, person, Norton personally. I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the storyline. I enjoyed it uh, personally. And I think, you know, a lot of people... That movie came out before Iron Man. Uh, and, it's you know, a lot of people will tote that uh, Iron Man was the kickoff of the uh, cinema- Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? Uh, but it was uh then it come out like two months before i think uh before iron man but all that to say early on for both movies there wasn't high expectations and because of that marvel cut deals that um probably wouldn't exist today for the way marvel movies are done right like they cast they cast robert downey jr which at the time uh he was not who he is today he was more or less considered an outcast of Hollywood, a lot of trouble with the law, drug uses, and, and, and stints and stuff like that. And then on the side with Edward Norton, they allowed a lot of um, creative control and flexibility with Edward Norton to allow him to say, you know, speak how he wanted, you know, give his creative direction to the movie, right? Um, which, on the Iron Man side, it did pay off, uh, ultimately, in the long run, right, with the casting of Robert Downey Jr., they also uh, had cast Terrence, Terrence Howard at the time, who was coming off the success of Hustle and Flow. So on that side, it looked like things was looking okay or looking like a, res- a decent project. Um, on Incredible Hulk side, it was still, you know, w- let's just see how it flows. It was two, I feel like it was just two different approaches to two MCU movies that, um, where they were a bit more to experiment and when seeing what the outcome would look like and if and if they didn't work well uh they still had one more movie and one more chance to get it right uh before they would be you know uh, i guess for for luck be liable to that merrill lynch uh, loan right i mean i mean talking about iron man a little bit more that was their first i understand why they presented as their the beginning of the Marvel Cinematic Universe mm-hmm. because of the box office success, but also like that was the first actor they casted, Terrence Howard to be specific, which was crazy to me. That was another tidbit that I never knew reading this book that oh, yeah. Terrence Howard was the first, you know, actor that the studio hired, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, so I thought that was interesting. But um that movie, like, you know, they kind of, it, it, a lot wrote on it from their perspective, I guess, because mm-hmm. Fox originally had the rights and they were going to like, they were talking about Tom Cruise and all that, but they, they were like, nah, Tom Cruise is too expensive, but we're not going to, 
right. pay him for this comic book movie. We don't know what's gonna do. Right. So right. like you know, Robert Downey Jr. got lucky. He was down and out, and right. he mm. got a great opportunity mm-hmm. because Terrence Howard was casted before you. So you know, um, so it's interesting. So yeah, so that's a great point because you know it's this book and it's a few other books that I've read in the past that really showed me gave insight to how these movies come together a lot of times. A lot of times it's like one begets the other. Uh, we have to get this in place before another actor will sign on or will, or before a studio will sign on. And so at the time, it, 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 Terrence Howard was the one of the catalysts that gave the movie legitimacy, actually, because he was Oscar nominated and he was coming off that success. So... It, it like you said, you was kind of surprised, but a lot of times these movies don't. It's like, hey, is so and so attached to that? All right, now I'll consider it because of this and because of that, and to garner interest and stuff is very interesting. That's a whole, that's a topic for another day. But yes, uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. So I mean, and you mentioned Edward Norton, like it's because of his creative control and him clashing with the director that right. he got removed from the franchise too. So right, like, you know. right, right, right. So uh, nowadays, as as this book goes into. Nowadays, the creative process is a little bit more. Uh, it's 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 cha- it's chaotic in some ways, but it is also very. I guess we could say templated in an, in other ways as well. Like their processes for pretty much all their movies is pretty. I'm not gonna say streamlined because it's not, but there is a very loose playbook that the movies try to follow. Uh, that helps cr- make it successful in what it is today and to varying results sometimes it's a success sometimes it's not um i'm not here not trying to dismiss the creative input of the directors and everyone that goes into the movies but there is a lot of things that is the quote-unquote marvel way yeah yeah absolutely and then again i don't want to spend too much time in the weeds but you just reminded me of an interesting thing that i again learned from this book was that the cave scene in iron man they were going to cut out <laughs> for for budget reasons or for whatever reason, one, yeah. of the, one of the people who write out the script, uh-huh. and it's like now you hear that 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 sound of him banging on the metal in every movie. It's like at the opening of every movie ever right, since. Right, so it's right. Just like certain things that just never. I don't know. It's right. certain things that you never. In hindsight, notice. you're like, how? In how hindsight. could you? Yeah, my bad. I'm yeah, sorry. how could the MCU exist without how, Tony Stark without in the cave? That. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, yeah. but no, you also speak on another interesting part, which is. The, on the business side is while Marvel Studios was getting up and running, it 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 faced a lot of behind the scene challenges, which one was budget. You know, even when they started being successful in, in these movies and blockbuster, you know, there was a power struggle and a power dynamic going on because Marvel Studios was still under Marvel Entertainment, right? Um, which was being run by Ike, you know, um and Ike was who he was. He, you know, we don't have to go into the long history, but he was, you know, very frugal and cheap person. So he looked over everything, all the budgets. There are stories about how, you know, bare the Marvel offices looked, how the chairs looked, how the offices was. There wasn't what there wasn't the usual amenities that you would see from a ultra successful company, such as just even snacks in the office. Uh, pens. I think there's a an anecdotal an story about how at one point everyone was writing in purple pens or pink pens because they ran out of black pens and they wouldn't order more pens until those pink pens was used. Something like that, you know. So you mm-hmm. hear about the budget consciousness of of the head of and the leadership that was dealing with Marvel Studios at the time, and then you also hear about the creative committee. Uh, that was established and the creative committee you know was pretty much set up to establish control of marvel studios so that was by proxy like ike and his teams uh the creative studio i guess would be considered ike's team by proxy and they were kind of established to give oversight to kevin uh give oversight on kevin and fergie and and marvel studios and their moves and and their decisions on how they wanted the direction of the movies to go and insight and where the storyline would go. So throughout that process, honestly, when I hear about those stories and how scripts had to get approved and get feedback and rewrites from the creative con- con- uh, council and get sent back to the studios and then there would be fights and back and forth. Honestly, it's a wonder that any of these movies got 
released early on. Yeah, I mean, they, they go through a lot. <laughs> they go through, <laughs> they a lot. go through a lot of turmoil. Right, so. right. And then they had to get the big, you know, big brother Disney involved because Disney had acquired them. And, you know, one of the early um, agreements when Marvel was acquired by Disney was that Ike would remain in control and wouldn't get, you know, pushed out and stuff like that. But even that kind of came to an end when the head of Disney at a certain point was like, listen, you know, we got to, we got to, you're not, you're not in, you're not in control anymore, right? Like that even got a bit nasty. So there was a lot of, a lot of issues behind the scenes with the, all the players that was involved in putting out the movies and not just the movies. We haven't even touched about the TV shows because that was its own division as well. So then you had different shows that was, you had the shows that was on Netflix, uh, which was kind of hit or miss. Did you watch any of the Netflix shows? Yeah, some of them were really good. Punisher and the Daredevils were good. The mm. other ones I didn't watch. I didn't watch Iron Fist and Jessica Jones. And I know I might get attacked for this, oh. but I didn't really watch Iron, oh. um, excuse me, um, Luke Cage either. Oh, I didn't, I didn't you catch are, up you are can't. You're done. You're done. You're done. <laughs> I, you're just, I mean, I know I got the gist of it, but no, nah, I never. <laughs> he said, I got the watch. gist. You took my line. That's my line. <laughs> I got the gist of it. I didn't watch it, but I got the gist of it. Um, yeah, no. and then also Agents of Shield that was when they produced on uh, right ABC. on AC. That was a big one for them. Right, and that's where things started getting you know dicey. You know, at least I mean I say start, but there was always there was always diciness going on throughout all the success. We see the success, but behind the scenes, there's always like a little thing behind the scenes that uh, was causing some sort of dispute or drama. In regards to the Netflix shows, I think I pretty I'm sure I watched. I definitely watched Jessica Jones. I watched Luke Cage. I liked Luke Cage. I felt like it was. I liked it for what it was. I don't know. I felt like a lot of people might have expected too much from it. But considering the origin of, I, did I say Luke Jones? Luke Cage. Luke Cage. No, you said it right. You oh said my Luke bad. Cage. You I'm sorry. Right. Considering uh, even just the origin of Luke Cage in the 60s, 70s, like I felt like it was pretty solid. I did not like Iron Fist. Oh, good. I feel like no one like I. I tried with Iron. I Fist. haven't heard anybody I say, say they like Iron, Iron Fist. Fist. I, I, yeah. I tried, but no. But I really enjoyed Daredevil and Daredevil. Yeah, Daredevil oh, was man. good. They got three seasons, if I remember correctly. Yeah, right? I think so. But Daredevil was to me was top notch, um, and Punisher. You know, but so I did watch the Netflix shows. Thought Jessica Jones was solid as well. And then, but I just, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., I couldn't get into, right? I couldn't get into Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., uh, and I couldn't get into uh, Inhumans as well, so. Oh, yeah, me either. Yeah, he said, oh, yeah, I forgot about that I forgot, completely forgot about that one, so. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, uh, again, but I, I will say, I think now, so where we're at now, right? I think the way Marvel is set up now in 2024 compared to where they were at in a journey, it does seem like they're shaping up to try to get everything under one house and not all these fragmented divisions for television and stuff and trying to make it a bit more cohesive. But there are still issues that linger for them, especially in regards to their licensing and who has the rights to what. You know, I think in as, as of today, they... They are all, all the different studios that own different rights to the characters are all under the, the Disney house, but it still doesn't mean that they can all play together, you know? Yeah, it's like, it's a very weird, you can only do it under certain circumstances kind of situation. Right. As as we've seen with uh, this recent Sony release of Madam Web, uh, for, for those who may not be familiar, familiar sony did release a movie this year uh madam web which is a character uh from the spider-man universe uh which was one a surprise to many people because they was as comic book fans were not really aware that a madam web movie was being put out and in the works and because of that that was a surprise but then watching it and seeing it it just seemed very clear that Sony is just pumping out movies to pump out movies so that they can eat off of the connection to the Spider-Man brand without maybe thinking about uh, the quality and consideration for comic book 
fan. Not even just comic book fan. Wow. Everybody who no, I wow. wouldn't even just say comic book. Nah, you I haven't you put that you articulated that perfectly. I can't even okay. like, you need to you should put that on a t shirt. That's exactly <laughs> what Sony's doing. Sony is trying to capitalize off the popularity of Spider Man and make anything that they can that's <laughs> even remotely related. Remotely. Like it's not their first, you know, last year they had Morbius. That was their release last oh, year. Oh yeah, you're um, right. Yeah. And yeah. then I think they had Venom uh two part two the year before that mm-hmm. so they yeah they 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 are consistently been trying to um siphon some of the popularity right from spider-man and and i think the cha- the issue with that is that um it co- it's i mean obviously outside of the fact that we know it's just the it's greedy business tactics and so forth there is a lot of confusion among the general public when they see these movies because they still see the marvel logo they still see the Marvel Association, you know, unless you're like really into it and paying attention. Most people are not going to be like, is this a Marvel Studios movie or is this just a movie based off a Marvel character? Cause a lot right, of- absolutely. Yeah. They exploit that, though. They know that. <laughs> That's what it is. It's right. like they know they're going to get some of that, uh, some of that loyal audience for the Marvel Cinematic Universe just because they'll think it's part of it. Right. Like, uh, I'm <laughs> I was visiting my niece and nephew yesterday. And, um, <laughs> this is funny. My nephew's mother was like, oh, well, we're going to, we want to watch Madam Web tonight. And it kind of took everything in me to say, don't watch that movie tonight. You're not going to enjoy it. But I know because they just associate it as a Marvel movie, right? Of course the kids should like it. Right. And I didn't like, well, who am I to get all well, actually, this isn't a Marvel movie. This is a this is a Sony movie. You know, I'm not going to get into all of that dynamics and stuff. But for a lot of people, that's literally what's happening. It's a lot of brand dilution and and you know siphoning off the the, the brand that Marvel's uh, studios have created over the years. You know. Yeah, one hundred percent. That's yeah. that's and I, and I will say they they were successful with the Venom series. The Venom series, and, yeah. And even though it wasn't good, I don't. I'm not saying it was good, but they were successful. It made money. They made so money. So I think that yeah. So I think they were like, all right, let's keep going. We got Madam Web. Right. We got Morbius, and then they're doing Craven the Hunter. Right. So it's like, right. Yeah, they're like, let's do it. And but, I think and I think the other thing about that to be mindful of is they they they. To counter, they have been responsible for the animated uh, Spider-Man movies, this, the universe, uh, Spideyverse, and, and mo- you know those animated right. movies of the Mom Morales character, Spider-Man character, and they've gotten an Oscar from that. So for them, they be they can, I guess their counters like, well, we're still doing good stuff. We just want an Oscar. Don't leave us alone, right? You could leave us alone, yeah. like scenarios, but. I will say that Madam Web movie did cause a lot of uproar in, in the overall community about the future of comic movies and the. I mean, it's always been commercial, but I guess the bastardization of characters and intellectual properties and stuff or whatever. So uh, the phrase I've been seeing is superhero fatigue. So mm. I think that that uh, movie <laughs> is on the opposite, the other side of it. It's like beyond fatigue. It's like they they were done. <laughs> like they've given up after that movie some people fair so. enough fair enough all right so so then what what is your take i guess on on the business side of things like we've talked about a lot of aspects of marvel uh studios or the different dynamics and relationships um and even with the movies you know from a business side any any thoughts or takeaways on some of the stories in their history yeah, um, well, I guess it was interesting to me reading the book because um, now in most theaters experiences, right, if you're going to a movie, most people are sitting there expecting something after the credits, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and Marvel, MCU, the cinematic universe is like responsible for that in the mainstream. I'm, I'm pretty sure we can give them credit for that. Absolutely. So it was interesting reading the book and seeing that. It was all Kevin Feige. He was all inspired by the end of Ferris Bueller where you had the post credit there. Right. Which, you know, I remember that as a kid. And maybe, I don't know if you watched it as a kid too, but I remember that post credit as a kid. But there's so many fans that were born way after that movie, probably never even seen that movie. Right, right. And for that to be such a part of your viewing experience and the business model when you're creating these, like, all right, so what's the post credit? What are we going to promote in there? We got to make sure we get whatever next three franchises are coming out teased in there. So it became a part of the business structure. Mm-hmm. And it's just interesting to me that it originated from a, you know, from a popular 80s movie. Mm-hmm, absolutely. Okay, fair enough. I I mean, I took a lot of, it was a lot of takeaways for me from this book. I think the first thing is like, 
into the importance of intellectual property and the idea of you just you just never know where the value of your intellectual property will go in the long run because you just you just don't right you know all these characters that was created way back 60s 70s probably before that as well 40s 50s and to see how these characters made that were created so long ago are worth like millions now and billions of dollars uh to to, to companies and to see that these companies you know marvel had sold away the, the rights to these intellectual properties uh, for essentially pennies to the dollar, right? Um, in hindsight, you can always reflect and be like, oh, that was a bad move. But a lot of times you just don't know, and, and especially when you can't predict the future, right? So um, I, I feel like right now a lot of the problems that Marvel Studios is having is due to the missteps of the past that Marvel as a whole did because of the circumstances that they were in at that time. Right, right. They had to leverage a lot of them, their properties mm -hmm. to stay afloat and to even survive in that climate. Right, absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, you can you can fault them or not fault them, but there's a whole argument to be made. Well, if they never even leveraged or licensed some of the IPs, would they even be in existence now as a whole? Would would there even be Marvel movies that we have now if it wasn't No, that? there'd be Toy Biz movies right. or whatever that company was called. So. <laughs> Absolutely, right? It'd be Toy Biz movies. So, you know, that's always something to, th to be mindful of. Um, I also think about, like, the process. Like, I'm, I'm, the process behind the scenes uh, is chaos, is madness. And, Sean, you know, you have extensive experience in videos and shooting footage and film and stuff. So I, I feel like none of that, uh, none of the behind the scenes filmmaking process uh, caught you by surprise. No, not more. Only more so stuff like Terrence Howard being the first person they cast it. <laughs> but but yeah, no, like the kind of the back and forth with the scripts and uh -huh. the changing of directors and the changing of producers and all that stuff. Like okay, yeah, this this it this just makes it. You, you know what? Oh, here's a little anecdote. Um, so you know, me and you, we we met. We was working on film and video projects together, right? And I did not like it. I, I did not like it. I the whole I can appreciate the film and video process, right? But when I'm reading this book and I'm like these twelve hour video, these twelve hour shoots, standing around on set, waiting for talent, editing, feedback. I just remember when I was in that process, I just could not deal. I was like, where's the it just felt very chaotic to me. <laughs> right? Yeah. And I was like, nah, I can't do this long term like it's cool it's fine it's it's not the hardest work or the most stressful but i was like the just the chaos of it just never really connected with me so then when i'm reading the book again and i'm i'm here i'm hearing these stories i'm like oh for a movie <laughs> like it's one thing when you're doing like short form but this is happening for a movie like this sounds like madness but when you see the finished product i do get it I, I totally get it. When you see the finished product and you see it come out very nice, especially when it's, you know, sometimes it's it's a bad finished product. But when you see a finished product and it's very, it's done very well and it's 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 just hitting right. It's it's like I get it. I understand the why and why so many voices was and and input was needed. But sheesh, the process to get there is, is not appealing to me. I'll just say that. Um, it's okay, so yeah. the process is not for you, the but pro the product. The, oh yeah, that's, I, that's cool. Yeah, I could appreciate the the pro the the uh the product, but I just reading those stories about the rewrites and the edits, and we can talk about the rewrites and the edits because another part of their business is a lot of times the finished product was not ready up until maybe two weeks before the actual release and the. Or days before it was supposed to be released, which to me sounds like a heart attack waiting to happen every time, right? Like there's right. so many things that can go wrong. Like, but because of the the visual effects that's needed for these movies, the edits, uh, adhering to uh, different rules and regulations of different countries, you know, a lot of that still you have to really be nimble and ready to adapt up until pretty much the twelve, the last hour, last minute, you know. So Sean, what do you think about them taking out those loans to finance those movies and, and the leverage that they 
<laughs> I get it. It's a it's the film business, and they were underdogs, so so I understand, and I get having to do that. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I, you know, I mean, <laughs> I know you're not a fan of incurring a huge amount of debt, um, but I feel like just with how expensive these movies are to make, you're gonna end up having to do it at some point, unless you're, you know, now Marvel's in the position where they can fund their own stuff, right? But um, you know, at that stage, you know, right. To well, make those movies they had to. Yeah. Oh, right, right, right. Now here's a plot twist. Here's a plot twist. In this case, it made sense to me. In this case, I had, you know, my spider no my spider senses, no pun intended, but it, it came out anyway. So we both out here with the Marvel reference today. Uh, <laughs> my spider senses did not go off when I read about the loan that they took out to finance their own movies. In this case, to me, this felt like this this was the right move. This made business sense. Of course, it was a risk, um, and it wasn't even like the most calculated risk, but it was it was it was appropriate. It didn't feel like it was just a reckless loan just to not just to do it and see what happens. Like everything from from the way I I saw it, it didn't concern me that they took out that loan to start financing and producing their own movies. This was I was actually okay with this, so I don't know what that says about me, but I can see that I, I didn't have any issues with that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it means that you don't have a, a hard stand <laughs> in a certain circumstance. You're like, all right, I can see the value in this. Right, so, right, right, um, right. Yeah. And then, how did you feel about? Um, and it's a, it's a similar question. How do you feel about them licensing their IP to all these different studios, right? How did that make you feel? Because even to this day, like they haven't made any Hulk movies since that Edward Norton one because Universal still owns it. Right. Um, and then, you know, the, we already talked about Spider-Man and Sony and how they've been, you know, siphoning that for years. So, yeah, how do you feel about that? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'll speak to how I feel about it from Marvel's perspective and then I'll speak to it about today, IP in general today. Um, at the time, I re- um, I don't remember when it when I started hearing news about them selling off their IPs. I I don't even think that I, I even read knew what it totally meant. I just I was just still reading comic books, right? And I was like, oh, I guess because in my mind there a, there wasn't a world that existed where movies from these characters could be made and and made well, right? So to me, it was like, is this gonna impact the comic book or not, <laughs> right? Um. Now, so when they made those, in hindsight, when they made those moves, I guess it made sense. I mean, it if you're bleeding, if you're about to go bankrupt and you have assets and you're trying to stay afloat, in theory, I guess that is the prudent move to make is to see how you can get cash flow. My only issue, my only issue is that it just felt like it was fire sales. And maybe it was a fire sale because they, they were... They were on fire, so maybe right. it was appropriate, but it just seems like the way those deals were structured and and the rates and stuff, it just seemed like they was just throwing everything out and just saying, "Give us your best offer and we'll take it." Um, and I guess that's what it was. I can't, in theory, say you know they shouldn't have never done it. I think maybe they should have maybe considered a few more of the variations and implications of what it would mean outside of just selling toys. That's, that's, that's probably my take on that. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. That, that, and I agree with you, right? Because as Sony's the biggest example, right. not only have there been so many money making opportunities that they've lost mm-hmm. <laughs> Sony, mm-hmm. but it's also it hurts the overall brand, right? Mm-hmm. Now you have this part of the franchise that you own that people associate with bad movies. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I agree with you. You know, now and see, I don't. We haven't even talked about the other avenues and channels. Like Sony has the rights to the Spider-Man video games, and and you know they're using that, and it's just, it doesn't just once you get those intellect, you know, those IP rights, it can really spread across so many avenues depending on how you structure those deals, right? So again, I don't. It's hard in hindsight. You can always be like, oh, that was wrong, but when you were in the heat of the moment and things. And bills got to be paid. You trying to do what you trying to do. I will say though, like in today's society, I'm and especially with the rise of like AI and things like that, I am very 
cautious and just I, I think I'm more alert now just to be mindful of all IP considerations for anything you do nowadays. I, and I think especially for like content creators, digital creators uh, in general, um, and I see it I see it already. I think we should all be mindful of our, our IP and our IP rights and the usage of it. You know, I just don't think we move forward uh, as creators without being mindful of it. It's a weird to think about it nowadays that you're doing stuff now, but you have to be mindful of what that usage could look like 10, five years from now. Uh, and will, And if it is done in a way that is very profitable, will you be profitable? Will you gain profits from it as well? Or did you unknowingly sign your IP rights away because you didn't read all the terms and conditions. It's a very gray future on, on where things stand with that. So, yeah. We can, we can probably go into, keep going into details from specific eras forever. Mm -hmm. Like, so, like, you know, the streaming era was interesting and mm -hmm. COVID and going through all that. But I think overall, um, Disney, Disney um, kind of affects how Marvel moves now more than it did before they went under their umbrella. And I think that's interesting. Um, right. I think Kevin Feige only has so much control over their success now. Mm -hmm. um, now that um, uh, Bob Iger is kind of steering the whole Disney ship. Mm -hmm. Like you alluded to earlier, you know, Blade has gone through a lot of changes and a lot of that is because of Bob Iger wanting to be strategic in what they release and mm -hmm. not a quantity thing, but a quality thing for right. their movies and mm -hmm. restore the reputation. So uh, it's interesting to see where they'll go from here now that, you know, how they got here is very interesting. It's interesting to see where they'll go next. So. Right. And, you know, yeah, and I think, like I said, the last, at least offhand, the last two movies that came out by my recollection was The Marvels and Guardian of the Galaxy 3. And right. I really and enjoyed... And Ant-Man was the one before that, I think. And then Ant-Man before that. I really enjoyed... Uh, Galaxy of the Gu Guardians. Ant Man was whatever. I think they nerfed. You know, we all know about Jonathan Jonathan Majors and that whole scenario and and dumps the fire mess that's going on over there. But even before that, I did feel like um they nerfed the character of Kang as a whole. But Marvel does that a lot, so nothing to cry over. But Galaxy of the Guardians, I really did enjoy. The Marvels, I enjoyed too. I felt like it was a different approach, but I will say this, and this is kind of what I thought is the issue, because they kind of diluted so much of their brand between the streaming shows and, and, and the shorts and the movies. Now, if you didn't watch Miss Marvel, or if you didn't watch Scarlet Witch, and you just went into watching the Marvels, you could you could you would be lost. You would be lost. Um which I thought was like, mm, I don't, I don't know how you rectify that, especially when the universe is getting so much larger from a storyline and, and a quality perspective. Um, but we'll see what happens. You know, my take is I enjoyed it. I definitely enjoyed it. Um, my understanding is that early on, Marvel and Disney was cooperating with the authors and was granting a lot of interviews for the book early on. Then, I think once they realized it wasn't going to be like a puff piece and like a fawning write-up of marvel it was kind of giving all everything good bad and ugly they started like telling people to like don't do the interviews and basically gave a gag order so you kind of i kind of picked up on that on certain chapters you know the the closer it got to the present day marvel the less it felt like it was not as candid as it as it was with the early yeah early with the earlier stuff that's Marvel. very true yeah and i didn't know that the end they told them not to do yeah. the interviews but <laughs> i did feel the lack of uh yeah. transparency as we got closer yeah, to present day exactly so for me i'm like hey if you if you're a marvel fan and of of the marvel of of marvel and comics and 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 just the movies overall i think it's a good read overall you don't necessarily need to be focused on the business side of it. It does give a good story from that perspective. And I also think if you are focused on the business side, this is a pretty good read and just like regards to intellectual property, operations, uh, teams working together, teams not working together and how those issues get resolved. I think there's a lot going on. 
Um, but also to what you said, it might have been a little bit too much. Maybe could have been condensed just a bit more. So, yeah, it's it's not a bad read. I wouldn't say don't read it. Uh, but nah, just, I wouldn't just say that be, at all. Just be in for the long read and similar to how this episode is a bit longer than usual because we tried to cover everything we could about this book. It, it's, a, it's a chunky one, but it's it's an enjoyable one. I definitely enjoyed it for sure. Yeah, I agree. And like I said, I learned something. So I think that that's the biggest uh, advertising I can give for the book Fair that you, you'll probably learn something new. Yeah, yeah so. I think it's going to, especially if you're on the business side of things, I think it's definitely going to put you in the mind state of just being more mindful of your... Uh, being more aware of your, of your intellectual properties and how you go about that, if nothing else. All right, so that's a wrap for this week's episode. We hope you enjoyed our review and thoughts on this book. Hopefully it provided you with some value and inspiration as you navigate through your business journey in life. As always, if you have a question you'd like us to answer on the show, shoot us a message on any of our social media channels. Also, don't forget to subscribe and share on Spotify and iTunes. See you again soon. In the meantime, keep grinding. The Business Grind is for entertainment purposes. Opinions expressed are those solely of the host and guests. Please consult with a professional and exercise discretion before engaging in any business endeavors. I'm out here on the grind. I'm out here on the grind.